Okay, so we are at the last chapter, chapter 21, which is about inferential analysis. So as most of the chapters in this book, they are mostly focused on the predictive abilities of the model in predicting how likelihood, uh, the likelihood of a certain event uh, happening. So we are like focusing a lot on the accuracy. So, um, but models we can also use to do run inferential analysis. So in the terms of inferential analysis, usually you need to make some judgments about certain components of the models. So you can base your judgments based on the coefficients or other parameters like uh, the confidence interval or the p-value. So in the case of uh, an, where models is used to make inferences, we often use the results to answer some predefined uh, questions or hypotheses before the start of the studies. So, based on what they say, so inferential analysis actually fo focus a lot on uh, validating the probabilistic or the structural assumptions that are made prior to fitting the models. Okay, so um. Definitely, as we are making inferences, usually in terms of those models, we have some certain assumptions about the models that we do want to plot. So the common assumptions that say, for example, in ordinary linear regressions, the assumptions is we always assume the residuals are independent and all the distributions of the data follows a Gaussian distribution and there's a constant variance. So this is just the basic uh, assumptions that goes on when you run an OL, like ordinary linear regressions. So um, so in this case, um, there are two ways that we can approach to access the components inside the model. So there are, uh, one is the p-values, and the other one is the confidence interval. So what they emphasize here is tidy models frameworks uh, tends to value confidence intervals over p-values because there are some um, there are some criticisms about uh, overemphasizing on the p-values, and they also say something about um because Bayesian methods are often more superior to both p-values and confidence intervals is easiest to interpret as well. Of course, they are more computationally expensive. So like for me, my work revolves around p-values. I do some variations, but not a lot. So I I feel like this book is like leaning heavily towards Bayesian theory. And it seems that only Bayesian is the best one, which I have some reservation about as well. <laughs> so um so in terms of um, counting data, so let's say your um, dependent variable or your is count data, so that usually follows a uh, Poisson distributions. So what they're using here is the biochemistry publications data from this PSDL package. So in this data set, it has information about a PhD biochemistry graduate and how, what are the factors that actually affected their academic productivity. So there are a few factors of, and they focus on the five, which is gender, the sex, marital status, whether they are married or single, the number of children that they have that are at least five years old, um, the prestige of their departments means schools they are supervisor, which schools they belong to, and the number of articles produced by their mentor in the same time period. So this data set is quite an old data set. It was a data collected between the year of 1956 to 1953. Then, um, so... What we can do is how they run is you can do, uh, load tidy models. The package is from this, as mentioned, PSDL. 
and as you plot it, you will see um majority of the students, actually PhD students, do not publish any papers, <laughs> like zero number of articles within the three years of graduation. So the count, the zero count is really high. Obviously, you can see also it's like um positively skewed, like right skewed, right? So we, and because the outcome data at our count, this is obviously leaning more towards the poison distribution. So we are few ways um, that we can do. One is the comparisons with two sample tests. So you can start with a very simple hypothesis testing. Let's say you have a one factor with two levels. So you can determine what they're trying to do here is to determine is there a gender differences in the number of publications. So basically what they are looking at here is, is there a difference in number of publications between male and female? So our now hypothesis is both males and females publish equally, the equal about the equal number of uh, articles, while then the other one is say there's a differences in the number of articles published between males and females. So FEM is this is the gender. So and the count is that. So what happens is when you do it this way, summarize, you can see we actually have more males than females, about 70 plus. So, and males also publish a lot more articles than females. Okay, and then in order for us to test whether our hypothesis works, one thing is you can use a poison dot test. So, you can compare the number of articles between male and female, which is 930 is the male one and 619 is the count for the females. One. What happens here is they're looking at poison is looking at true rate ratio whether it's equals to one or not equals to one so they automatically will generate the 95 percent confidence interval for you and the rate ratio here so the p value refers to here but presenting the data as this format is quite difficult so what they do is we can use something in the broom package we can use a side D functions in the broom package. So presenting it in the table form this way will allow us to compare side by side easier. The estimates are all the same. The only thing is the p-value is listed in and the confidence interval. This is low and high. And then they stated whether it was one-sided or two-sided. Any questions so far? So the next part is um they say while well, we can use the poison distributions, but you might want to assess the model use, using fewer distributions uh, assumptions. So the two methods that are highly encouraged is one is called the bootstrapping and the other one is the permutation test. So to do hypothesis testing, we can use something called the infer package. And this package is part of the tidy models framework. So in order for you to run hypothesis testing, first, load the, definitely load the library. And this is the data set, followed by specify what you want to test. So, this ART stands for number of articles and predicted by gender. So male or female. So what they're doing here is male versus female and predicting how many articles. Because we are doing hypothesis testing, so we are looking at the differences in the mean. So what you can do in calculate, the next part you have to specify calculate, the set is differences in mean, and you have to specify the order comparing male versus two female. So here, 
the stats came out this week, but you have no idea what it is. So what happens is you can, before the spec uh, calculate, you can generate, use the bootstrapping. This is how we do the bootstrapping. So usually for bootstrapping, you have to set seeds before you do the bootstrapping. So 2,000, we are not running like 10,000. So just for ease of computation, we just generate a 2,000 reputation and you specify the type bootstraps. Right, so they will have, then if you uh, run the bootstraps out, they will have 2,000 rows. So it means 2,000 replications, the sets, we have 2,000. Then in order for us to get the confidence interval, you can use some function called get underscore ci. So here you can see the lower CI and upper CI um, in the range of it does not involve zero. So most probably it's not significant. One way is you also can visualize it. There's a function, a very cool function that I just learned, is that you can visualize it using a function called shade confidence interval. So they, I'm not sure how to change the color, but um, it's kind of fancy that they can show you where it's at 95%. So then you obviously you can see it's a two-tier two -tier analysis. Okay, then the end point is just, um, it's just a lower bound and upper bound of CI. So the green part here, the shaded part is just 95% confidence interval. And some people who are like more like left patients, then you need a p-value. The info package actually has something to call, uh, has a function to help you compute the p-value. Once you run the permutations, right, you run you run the uh, bootstrapping. After that, you can change it to like still the same one. So instead of bootstrap, you can change it to permute. But before that, because we are running uh, two groups. So make sure you're hypothesized here, you have uh, hypothesized with the independent. And then it's still like 2,000 rows. Then you can, if you need to see where is your p-value, you can use a function called shape p-values. So you will see this line. This is the p-value, the red line. Then here is the pink side. So these are the two tier. Direction is two tier. So if you really, if like from here we can see it's significant, but in order for you to report it, let's say you need the real p value, instead of saying shape p value, you should use a function called get p value. And as you can see, the p-value is 0 0.002, so we can just say, okay, um, there's a differences in the number of publications between male and female. Okay, so these two sample or what we call the independent t-test is just a very simplistic way of looking at the number of publications. So in most of the case, in the nature, by natural world, you have a lot of factors that contribute to the uh, dependent variable. So you can, you might have multiple predictors, right? So we might want to look at what are the steps. Let's say you have multiple predictors. So the rest of the part here are focusing on like linear models, which is what the whole tidy models book is about, linear models. So we might have a multiple covariates or predictors enter into the model simultaneously, or you can do a hierarchy way where you enter uh, each predictors one by one. So in, let's say we're going to use the poison, poison rack package is in part of the PASNIC uh, in tidy models. So 
let's say we will need to set our engine, right? The default engine is always DLM. But if you're using count data, you have to set, you have to specify the engine models, which models you're using. So what we can do, we specify the models. Then we feed ARP is the number of articles. So it's still a count data, number of articles predicted by all the covariates. So as mentioned just now, in this data set, we have actually five predictors. Okay, the first one is um, male versus female, whether you are married versus not married, number of kids. Um, the three, I think this was like the mentor, and I don't remember the other one, PhD. I think it is uh, the prestige of the department, like how famous, I don't know how they measure the prestige of the department. And then this is the mentor, number of articles produced by the mentor. So here you can see, if you just look, if you don't tidy up, this is the basic coefficients that you will get for each. This is the intercept followed by the coefficient for each of these predictors. You have the number of freedoms and the residual reported, the AIC also reported. If you combine it with the tidy method, it will make everything arranged uh, in a table form. And because we want to get the confidence interval, you have to specify the con, con int true and the level. Here is a bit weird. They set the alpha to 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.05. But never mind. You, if you look at the p value, most of it is less except for this PhD. So this one has zero in it. So the confidence interval has zero in it. So this is most likely the one not significant. So then we can use, okay. So while we know, okay, PhD might not be significant. So we might want to, next step is to conduct a check of the model assumptions. So you want to fit the model without using the poison likelihood to calculate the confidence interval. So one thing is you want to compute the bootstrap, right? We can use something called the resample package. Okay, so how you do is um, you use red interval. Here is your model followed by which data and the model we're using GLM, but for the family, you remember, you have to remember to set it to Poisson. Then they will have all this uh, generated out. And as you can see, the estimates, they will have the lower, upper, and the estimates, the coefficient. Then we can also, so these are the two ways. So this one and this one is presented in this figure. So these are the two types of confidence interval that you can actually compute for the model. One is the parametrics where you have actually the value there. So this is calculated and this one. So what is special about this one is they talk about the width of the confidence interval. The darker blue line, right, is the one that when you use the bootstraps, this one. This one is using the R sample where you specify the family as poison. You will see the width are slightly wider for all these parameters. So, um, one thing is that they say if the data, right, um, when you compare the bootstrap intervals are actually usually wider. And then 
but if the data are truly poisons, usually the intervals will have a similar width. Okay, so we roughly know based on this data, if you just look at confidence interval and p-value, we know that mm, PhD might not contribute to the number of articles produced per year, like produced in the last three years after graduation. But how do we want to really, really prove it? We usually do something called the uh, what statistics where you divide the estimates by the standard error or you can do something called the likelihood ratio test which is also a very controversial method so what we do is we can plot two models one model with the PhD included as the predictor and the other model is without the PhD included as predicted and then you compare the two models to see which model is more superior so we have another model here the one we use where we only have four predictors the log lean reduce has only four predictors and then the original one this glm would have the log lean bit has all the five predictors in it so you can use the log LTR, the likelihood test, is you use compare using ANOVA. So if you just want to compare the coefficients, right, you will have to use like extract fit and gene. The model compare the reduced model with four predictors with the models with five predictors and specify the test as the likelihood test. And then obviously you can use the tidy function to tidy up. And we really look at p-values. <laughs> Here, you can see the p-values on 95% confidence interval. So it's larger than 0 0.05. So you can say that the second model, okay, versus, so, You know, let me see. Uh, this residual, this is the oh, this is the PhD one. So and it's not significant, right? So actually means that the models with four predictors are actually just sufficient to explain it. When you have the other model, it becomes not significant. So so this is just a reasoning of why we can exclude a PhD from further analysis or exclude PhD as part of the predictor. Do we have questions so far? No. No. Okay. So let's talk now about a more complex model. At the beginning of the um before we start, right? So we actually look at this uh, distribution of the data and we realize that we have a number of zeros, right? Or maybe one zeros to one, but that's really a high number of zeros, number of articles. So for a more complex model, we can look into something called a zero inflated point, but zip order. And this is, in this case, when you're using these models, you actually created two core variables. One is the count data, how many, like what's the real number. And the other one is, what is the probabilities of zero? So when you use the model, you set it as Poisson. But um, the engine, you have to set it to zero inflated. So it's zero I N F L. Okay, then definitely to fit the model with spec, uh, you included the specifications. After that, the fit, right? So just now, as you know, we don't include the PhD. So here they have four predictors and here followed by 
five predicted. And then you run, you will have the coefficients for four and here the zero inflated models with all the five predictors. So we will also test ANOVA. So we'll compare these two models, the one with the four and the, versus the one with the five. Uh, sorry. No, we will compare the zero inflated one with the reduced one, the four, which is the previous models before predicted, excluding the PhD. And then we will compare this zero inflated fit with all these two. So what happens is you will run into a tight error because not all methods are applicable. So you cannot just run like basic tests for different models. So there's no ANOVA for zero inflated models. So because we cannot compare the values, the p-values or maybe the coefficient, the other way is to use an alternative like information criteria statistic like AIC. Mm, besides AIC, there are also other information criteria statistics like um, R square, I think, then BIC and AIC. So basically for BIC and AIC, these are the more commonly used. And how do you know a model is slightly better than the previous model or like the later model is the lower the number of AIC and BIC, the better the model is. So what happens in AIC and BIC, this count information criteria statistics is each time you um you include the extra parameters, they will penalize the AIC and BIC. So how do we do it is you need to extract the AIC values for each model. So for zero inflated, we can use something called we extract just the AIC. And then the log linear is you extract only the AIC. So as you can see, 3232 versus 3312. So it seems that this zero inflated um, model has lower value of AIC. So it is a better model than the um, linear regression model. Obviously, uh, there's no p-value, so it's very hard to conceptualize. Okay, so now zero inflated has lower number of AIC, but what should be the appropriate differences in the numbers of AIC? What should be the differences in AIC? Because we only say, this model is more superior than the previous model. So it is very difficult to conceptualize these values. So to solve these problems, we will do something called the resampling. And we can compute AIC models, uh, AIC values for the model. So what we do is you set up, we will create 4,000 model feeds. So here, this is the zero inflated one, and this one is just with the four predictors. You set it, and you use bootstraps 2000, and you set a parent to true. Then you mutate, you split them, one into the log linear one, and one is into the zero inflated one. And then you run the bootstraps. And then after that, you need to extract fit and din means you only extract the AIC values out. And then we can compare the mean. So what happens here is the mean of this uh, zero inflated model, zip, is lesser than the mean, lesser than the GLM model. It's true. That's why you get one. So means the differences actually are significant. So means zip model is actually a better model. 
Next one. So since we also have we sampled all the model fits, right? 2000. Then we can also create a bootstrap confidence interval as well. So what you can do is the type here, where you can get the models, then mutate the zero coefficient, and then make sure the type you specify is to zero, or else you will not get the estimates. Then you have the estimates for each of these predictors. You can obviously visualize them in reusing the histogram, then use the three facet wraps for each intercept and these five predictors. This uh, V line is this gray dot. This is where the zero is. You can see, except for MENT, the mentor one, the V line here, this zero is always in the middle of the distribution or somewhere in the distribution. The only time it didn't touch that um, distribution is when under the mentor. Okay, and what else I see? Ah, the distributions, when looking at this, this is one good way to check for assumptions as well. The distributions for this one seems to be heavily skewed. The one for female, male, females are also heavily skewed. Okay, then you next, you need to check whether all your models converge because remember we ran the bootstrap model. You need to make sure the models are all converged because usually what they say is um, when you have like skewed distributions, sometimes the model might not converge. So you might need to exclude some data, then uh, exclude some outliers, then we run the models. Okay. Um, ah, we have this INT. So you can compute different types of bootstrap interval. One is the percentile one, and the other one is the P, the coefficients one. So if you run INT, then this PCTL stands for percentile, P stands for the student T. So it's specified under here. And finally, besides the two uh, complex model, the GLM, there's also a new one. It's called the multi-level models where you can use the hierarchical variations and non variation model, which is mixed model. non variation model is the mixed model. And uh, if you have longitudinal or repeated measures, it might be good to use these multi-level models. And that's all. So tidy models framework, usually we can have two. One is usually for predictions or one for inferential statistics. Obviously, today's chapter is more of inferential statistics. So it just demonstrates that packages and functions that we learn from tidy models package can actually be used for hypothesis testing, provided that you have um, make some assumptions about how the model looks like before you start. So you need to have a prior hypothesis or framework. So that's not any ones want to talk contribute anything. We can also look at the share slides. The one that I think they're using a different uh data set. So in the one um they use a data set on the trail running races. So in this one, they have quite a number of predictors. And what happens is they obviously they set the states up from the very, very beginning. Um, they also show how to use a uh, tidy models. So this one is the ggplot just looking at what is the elevation gain on the um average velocity. So it makes sense higher as the elevation gain per mile increases, the velocity actually decreases. Then this is they run a very basic one, LM models. 
and they look at two predictors for how the elevation gain and distance predicted the velocity. And they tidy up and you can see the p-values here. Obviously, all are significant. These two factors are significant. This one is very significant, the elevation gain. Then, so the broom package, right, the tidy, tidy functions in broom package actually existed before the tidy model. So you can actually use it, let's say you want to use for the base R as well. This tidy and you can also run correlation. This is the base R core.test. And then you run it tidy as well. Then what else do you need? Then they also have this infer. So infer package just now is just for higher level hypothesis testing. You can specify the relation ship, but make sure you specify the direction. And you can calculate the statistics based on simulations or based on their distribution. So it works for both continuous and discrete variables. So here is using the permutation. The permutation is this one. Yeah, this is using the permutation. How to the average elevation gain, how it predicts the velocity. And you run for easy, they only run 1,000 application. So permute. And then you visualize the shape P value. And this here it is. So this one is significant. Very highly significant because it's skewed to one side. And then you get the p-value, ah, it's zero. So it means it's less than 0 0.001, 0 0.001, yeah. And then confidence interval, this shape confidence interval that we talk about, you can see 95%, yeah, roughly around here. Between negative 0.55, to negative 0 0.52 like that. Okay, you can also use a hypothesis where you have a theory. So your now is point mu is the mean seven. Let's say you really have a hypothesis to begin with at the start of the study. Then you can also use um. I don't remember what is this assume T is. I, I just don't remember. I look it up. Um, this one is the one with, like, you really have a hypothesis so you know what is the mean, whether it's past 7 or below 7. But this one, the assume T, I mean, does anyone know what this assume T stands for? Then I think we have the p value is 0 0.015, so it's definitely too significant. Ah, this is the student t test, so it's an independent t test, <laughs> student t test, so it's just a simple t test. And then the direction it makes sense because here, then you see two sided. 95% and definitely is significant. And the one with multiple one, we also talk about, you can use the fit function. Uh, sorry, you, spec sorry, you specify the formula, then you fit it. And then you should use it with tidy that you clean it up. Here, this one is you hypothesize and you specify your now to be the independent type permute. And then you bootstrap it to get the value of the bootstrapping. Then you compare. That's how you get the p-value. So this intercept, no. This one, not significant, but the participants is significant. So the only significant is this participant. And the rest are not significant. You can see 
in this red line, this is your p-value. The vertical line is your p-value. Not significant, not significant, significant. And then if you hate p-value and you just want to look at confident interval, you can look whether the um the values do they contain zero or do they not contain zero? Oh, this one contains zero. But I think this one is based on percentile. Yeah, this is percentile. I don't think it's CI. Okay. Um, let's look at this one. I think the same one. Eight station alpha lower and the alpha method is percentile. Addition participant. Yeah. This one is significant because it contains the CI contains zero. Then obviously you can run a list of models, full partial minimal, you can run it all at the same time if you're using the tiny model. Then use um, extract fit engine to get just the AIT value and you can see full partial and minimal. So the best seems to be either partial or full because the AIT are lower. 3123 and 3122, they are about the same. I don't think these two models are significantly different. But um, because we value partial monitoring, so usually you will take the partial model. But you obviously you need to test whether differences in AIC are significant or not significant. Is back to that, we use bootstraps and make sure you set a parent to true. And then you can see the value of here. These are all AIC value. Full minimal partial. These two are. So we full on partial will be slightly better than minimum. Okay, then we summarize it. These two. So you compare whether full is less than partial. Then you compare whether partial is less than minimum. And then you have the values. And here they just be careful is like the times, right? They only use a very small value. But usually the best one is like 1,000, I think is still a little. You should use about 5,000 to 10,000. But that will take quite a num um quite a lot of time. So that's it. Anything else that I should talk about? Um, no, that was great. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. Just um. Uh, we need to um, understand a bit more about uh, how to explain the result. And so what the basically, uh, what we have obtained applying those tests, the test is treatable for uh, the, the results and so you mean you mean for the inferential analysis, yeah. right? Yeah. So basically you I think the steps are if I understand your question, the steps are you start with a hypothesis testing. So if you I think mostly in if you're a data scientist or data analyst, you do more of a predictive models. But if you are more in the academia, you do more of a hypothesis testing where you're trying to get some inferences to study the event or the phenomenon. So you need to have a very strong theory or some kind of hypothesis. And this theory and hypothesis usually comes from past literature. 
So past studies have been conducted in the similar field, then you have an idea of the direction. What happens if we, in these chapters, we are all using two tiers, but most of the time you have a very clear hypothesis, right? You should be using one tier because you know the directions, whether it's on the left side or the right side. So if you have a very clear theory and you know the direction, you should be using one tier, unlike what they're doing here, two tier. Then you build your hypothesis depending on what kind of models. If the usual one usually is the GLM one model and then you look at the predictors. So you test and you see which of the predictors are necessary. Then you try to reduce the model. Then you compare whether the reduced model is better than the non-reduced the full model using the likelihood test. Then you run a bootstrap to get all the estimates value and then you compare the values again. I think that's the main flow of thing. I think one thing that they don't emphasize is if whenever you run an inferential analysis, right, it's very important that at the very beginning, once you know what model that you want to run, whether it's a zero inflated or the GRM, you have to understand the assumptions that comes with the model. So the best way is to explore it first and look at how the data distribution looks like then that would really help you to determine what kind of models that it should be. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, our last uh, chapter for this mm. uh, book. And, uh, and so, okay, so I hope uh, um, we all had a bit of uh, like overview for, for what tidy models can do for modeling. And um, I propose that if we want to do uh, other sessions sharing our job, so our projects uh, using tidy models, such as, for example, analyzing a data set. Uh, and showing which model we've chosen and why, uh, what are the results. So let's let's think about that. Mm -hmm. Let's catch up on Slack. And in case we do uh, one last session uh, for sharing those things, or maybe we can postpone it for the next week uh, and do it the, the following week. What do you think? Um, next week might be a bit difficult, but I feel like in two weeks' time, that could be my timing would be more like better. I think days fourteen, right? Yeah, I feel like end of November, but I'm not sure like whether the rest um wants to do the additional session. Well, so it's like a. I think what you're suggesting is like a closing session, right? So we just present the project and talk about more about how we use tidy models. Or maybe you can talk in the Slack. You can pose a question. <laughs> Patrika, do you want to just pose the questions and see how they respond? Is it still ongoing? <laughs> or is it disconnected? Right. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you. Bye.